have paused at least momentarily. Uh, so I think I am going to go ahead and begin. Um, welcome everyone to this webinar on US federal guidance and persistent identifiers. Um, if you haven't already, if you've just joined us, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're located and why you're interested in the topic. So these are our presenters today. Um, first, we'll be hearing uh, from Shauna Sadler uh, from ORCID. Uh, and I'd like to give special thanks to Shauna because she was the original person who organized an earlier version of this event. Um, that took place at the 2023 Joint Conference on Digital Libraries, otherwise known as JCDL, uh, which did take place in June in Santa Fe in New Mexico. So thank you so much, Shauna, for being the um, in initiator of this event. <laughs> um, we'll next be hearing from Carly Robinson, who is with the Department of Energy Office of Scientific and Technical Information. I will be talking to you about ROAR, I am the Technical Community Manager for ROAR, the Research Organization Registry. And then we'll be hearing from Isaac Farley uh, from Crossref and Shaoli Chen from Datasite. Uh, this is a 90 minute session um, and here's what we'll be covering. Um, we will first hear from Shauna who will uh, give us the benefit of her expertise on the global context of PID strategies. Uh, we'll next be hearing from uh, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Carly Robinson, who will be kind of reviewing the US government PID guidance, um, the OSTP memo, but other things as well. And then we'll be hearing uh, from representatives of each of uh, four persistent identifier organizations. We'll be hearing from Shauna again, who will tell us about ORCID's role in the US guidance. Um, I will tell you a little bit about how ROAR, the Research Organization Registry, helps meet these US research goals. We'll be hearing from Isaac, uh, who will tell us about Crossref, open infrastructure and identifiers to support po policy. And our final presenter will be Shaoli Chen, uh, who will, uh, from Datasite, who will tell us about how Datasite connects research and advances knowledge. Um, as I mentioned, this is a 90 minute session. We're anticipating that these presentations will take uh, probably about 65 to 70 minutes, which should give us a good solid 20 minutes for audience discussion and panelist discussion. And so we will be saving all questions until after all of the presentations are done. Um, that being said, you can, of course, post questions in the chat as we go along. And as people are able, they may um, reply to them there uh, during the presentation. All right. So with that, um, we have a few logistics. Uh, this session is being recorded, as I'm sure you can tell from uh, the Zoom notification. We will post it publicly afterward, and we will also send it to everyone who registered. We'll also send and share the slides. Um, we do encourage you to engage in congenial discussion in the chat during the presentation, and of course, ask questions afterward. Uh, please do stay muted unless you are speaking uh, and you can leave your camera on or off. As you may have noticed, this is not a, a webinar session, it is a meeting session, um, which you know entails certain different technical things. Uh, but afterward, when we do get into the uh, Q&A uh, portion of the event, please do use the raise hand feature in Zoom uh, and I'll call on you and you can ask a question then just to keep things a bit orderly. And then I will be uh, launching a survey after this, very brief, and I'd really appreciate your responses to that. All right, with that, I will turn it over to you, Shauna. Hey, thanks so much, Amanda, I really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for joining us today. This is really exciting. Um, so I am joined today by my colleague, Nabil Sibi, who will share important URLs uh, in the chat with you. Um, Nabil is also fluent in French and Arabic, so Nabil can translate and support any of your questions in those languages as well. All right, next slide, please. So I'm happy to say that adoption of persistent identifiers has begun. Um, value has been recognized by various stakeholders in the global research community. Um, and we're now starting to see policies developed by various multinational organizations, such as the organization shown on this slide. So the G7 Science and Technology Ministerial issues an annual science communique. Uh, this year, the communique included languages in support of promoting interoperability, sustainability of infrastructure and research outputs, and the broad adoption of the FAIR data principles. Um, the G20 Science Academy Summit held in India also released a communique further supporting the important role of technical infrastructure interoperability and in fair data principles. 
A quick note, the URL that Nabil is going to share with you and the URL on the slide are not working right now because the presidency is transitioning from India to Brazil and the URL is now broken. However, this demonstrates the importance of persistent identifiers. And so hopefully our friends from India and Brazil will begin assigning DOIs from our colleagues at Crossref or Datasite uh, so that we can have persistent access, reliable access to their very important work. Um, so sometimes things don't work out, but uh, you have to <laughs> make the best of it. Um, and then also, of course, UNESCO has the Recommendation Open Science Report uh, that was issued. Um, again, also language that supports the adoption of fair data principles and persistent identifiers. Uh, we've been notified by UNESCO that we are to expect another report coming out in the next week or two, um, and it's going to be called the UNESCO Open Science Outlook. Uh, and again, we've been told that to expect positive supportive language for persistent identifier adoption. Okay, next slide, please. So what we've noticed is with these multinational organizations issuing these positive policies towards PID adoption, then it goes to each national level. Um, and so we've noticed that there are lots of different countries starting to develop their own national policies relating to PIDs. Some call it open science policy or roadmap. Um, so we formed a group inside of RDA um, to create a community of practice. So these countries can come together and coordinate and just be able to help each other out. Um, so, uh, so there's a link for the, uh, the PID interest group. So if you'd like to uh, join, um, we have published a, a guide and a checklist uh, with nine case studies. So from these nine countries listed here, and what we noticed were there are these eight common characteristics in their case studies. So just to help countries who are starting to develop these PID strategies of their own, um, you know, we just sharing is so helpful. Uh, so we have been notified France is interested in becoming the next. Um, country on the list. Um, and we've also been notified by countries in Asia and Latin America as well. So we're excited to see this grow. Um, quick note, it's early days for everybody. Uh, nobody is uh, has this figured out yet. Nobody has it perfect. We're all in this together. And so the more that can join the group, the merrier, and we can be mutually supportive. Next slide, please. So the furthest along is actually Australia. They have developed a really great structure and formalized a group. Uh, they've been working all year on this. It's just been an incredibly comprehensive process. Um, so they are developing a strategy and a roadmap for Australia. Um, we are told that hopefully in the next few weeks or early 24 to expect an update from them and to hear more about the next phase of their work, which was, will be really exciting and I think inspirational for a lot of a lot of countries around the world. All right, next slide, please. So you may have noticed on that list, the United States was not listed. Don't worry, <laughs> it's early days for everybody. Um, the US is a bit more tricky. It's a bit bigger and more complicated than say Australia. Um, so there's gonna probably be a few different approaches, um, some different ways. And so one of them is going is starting now and it's a US national PID strategy uh, it's going to be organized by ORFG, and the idea is that there's going to create a framework, and then where the idea is that this framework will be advanced within NIZU to be formalized as a U.S. national standard. And then, so work on this is going to be expected to begin in early 24. Um, NIZU members and non-members can join, um, but an ORF, ORFG will circulate uh, some information soon. So if you're interested, uh, you know, get in touch with them. All right, next slide, please. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Carly, now. Thanks, Shauna. Yeah, so I'm um, Carly Robinson. I'm at the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Scientific and Technical Information. Um, I won't be speaking kind of specifically about DOE very much, but but wanted to kind of talk more generally about U.S. government um, PID guidance, um, two pieces of guidance in particular. And I saw a lot of my uh, U.S. government colleagues on the line. So kind of we're, we're all working on this together right now. So if you go, could go to the next slide, there are kind of two um, memos in particular that talk about persistent identifiers and kind of ask um, US federal agencies to implement different um, persistent identifier aspects. And the first um, is the shorthand, we call it NSPM 33, National Security 
Presidential Memo Number 33. And this is on, you know, supported research and development national security policy. And this came out um, in the the in 2021 um, and is kind of broader than persistent identifiers, but there are some key persistent identifier language included. The other memo is um, ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research um, or the, the 2022 OSTP public access memo. And so I'm going to be talking about the persistent identifier language in both of these memos in more detail. And if you go to the next slide, um, something that I wanted to kind of hit on before going into that language is you will see two acronyms um, used in, in, this, uh, in these memos that really mean the same thing. And so I kind of wanted to hit on that in advance um, just so you all hopefully can follow that. So, um, you know, we've been using the term persistent identifier and using the acronym PID, I think, um, in this community, that's something we are all very familiar with, uh, you know, the persistent identifier service organizations, the community, subject matter experts all use PID as the acronym. And even the U.S. government, I, I think uh, many of us were using that acronym. Um, and we even have a National um, Science and Technology Council subcommittee on open science subgroup called the persistent identifier subgroup. Um, well, our wonderful colleagues that were developing NS NSPM 33 were not PID folks. They were not really involved in the community, um, not necessarily subject matter experts. And so I think trying to be helpful, they came up with an acronym <laughs> to describe what, what they were talking about. And they used the acronym DPI, Digital Persistent Identifier. Really, these are interchangeable. So wherever you see DPI, it we're, we mean persistent identifier. So. Next slide. Um, I first wanted to start um, um, with NSPM 33. This came out January 14th of 2021. And this was at the very end of the last administration, the Trump administration, um, in, in the final uh, day or so of that administration. And um, this is a broader memo. It directs action to strengthen protections of US government supported R&D against foreign government interference and exploitation. And so, you know, it, it, it kind of generally addresses aspects um, um, relating to that. But there are two places where persistent identifiers are specifically called out. And here we're, we're specifically talking about persistent identifiers for people, for researchers. And first it says that funding agencies uh, shall establish policies regarding requirements for individual researchers supported by or working on any federal research grant to be registered with a service that provides a digital persistent identifier for that individual. So this is saying that agencies need to have a policy around persistent identifiers for individuals. It also says that agencies should standardize forms for initial disclosure as well as annual updates, integrating digital persistent identifiers wherever appropriate and practicable. And there has been kind of tremendous work and conversation got done on both pieces, but this second piece on the standardized forms, I wanted to, to call out first. And so if you can go to the next slide, um, there's been um, some recent developments that are really exciting. Um, so there are these two forms that are used to collect disclosure information that are a part of um, US government funding applications. There's the um, biographical sketch and the current and pending support documents. and um, this effort um, was, was um, done across agencies, but it was led by NSF and NIH. And they, um, we all kind of developed these common forms that can be used across agencies to collect this type of information. And so those have been finalized. And so agencies are kind of in the process of starting to work those into their workflows, which is very exciting. And you know, for this audience, uh, you know, one thing that is really exciting is that both of those forms um, can collect persistent identifiers for researchers, specifically those senior key personnel. And so um, that's great. That that second piece in that memo, um, we've kind of uh, been able to achieve here. So so that's great. Um, moving on to the next slide, kind of before the the those um, disclosure. Uh, forms were standardized. Um, there was a lot of work done before that um, on uh, agencies trying to understand how they should implement NSPM 33. And so because that, that the memo came out at the end of the last administration, we had a new um, administration coming in, the Biden administration. You know, agencies wanted to understand what the expectations were with this memo for the, for the um, new administration and also just had some questions about kind of what the expectations for implementation were. 
And so again, this was kind of a cross agency, cross government effort um, was led to develop this NSPM 33 implementation guidance to give more guidance around the expectations um, for, for implementing the memo. And so there is, um, I think there are four sections, but one of those sections is around persistent identifiers and, and being more explicit about the expectations. So if you go to the next slide, there were seven different areas um, that were addressed. These were kind of open questions that, that agencies had for you know, the expectations about this implementation. And so this guidance um, addressed those. So um, I'm not gonna go into the detail. We could spend a whole hour going through this or even longer, but the areas it addressed was incorporating persistent identifiers into grant and cooperative agreement application and disclosure processes. Um, it addressed questions around requiring persistent identifiers versus providing as an option for disclosure. Um, it addressed categories of individuals um, that should be provided this persistent identifier option for disclosure. Um, it had a discussion about um, using the available persistent identifier services and not necessarily recommending that you, the US government creates their own thing from scratch. Um, one thing that is really key, um, and I think uh, there's been a lot of great discussion around, was the common core standards that a persistent identifier service should meet to be included as an option for disclosure in federal grant cooperative agreement application processes. The next was ensuring interoperability across um, multiple persistent identifier options. Um, you know, if there are multiple options at some point that do meet those common core standards. And also there were questions, um, and, and this helped provide guidance around, you know, potential for public disclosure of information provided um, to research agencies through that persistent identifier service. And on the next slide, um, it was also wonderful because we had the opportunity um, to provide a definition for what um, we mean by digital persistent identifier in the, the US federal government case. And so this is, I would say a very technical definition that is really aimed for agencies to understand what the expectations are. And so this first sentence up at the top here, a digital, um, a, what, what we mean is a digital identifier that's globally unique persistent, machine resolvable and processable, and has an associated metadata schema. So that's kind of the definition that we're working from. Um, and then in the case of NSPM 33, um, what it's referring to is a digital persistent identifier for individuals that can be used to disambiguate and identify an individual person. And um, again, because this is a, a bit more technical, um, an interagency group also defined what we mean by all of those terms, what we mean by globally unique persistent, machine resolvable and processable and have an associated metadata schema. Now I will say, I think we've gotten a lot of great feedback from other agencies that this definition maybe is not super understandable to just the general public about what a persistent identifier is. So I think, um, like I said, I think this definition is more tailored to the agencies and some other agencies have, have kind of a more general definition that is helpful to, to different communities. And next slide, I think I'm switching gears here, um, moving from the NSPM 33 memo to the 2022 OSTP public um, access memo, which came out in August of last year. And so this memo built off the 2013 memo, um, increasing access to the results of federally funded research, which focused um, on making journal articles and data that is um, funded by US government agencies more publicly available. And so this new memo um, kind of uh, went beyond that. It also addressed journal articles and data, but went beyond that and talked about scientific and research integrity and that we can use persistent identifiers and metadata to, to help um, ensure that. And so another great thing is uh, this memo ties to NSPM 33 in a couple of different places, including having the same definition for persistent identifier. Next slide. So this is kind of the that section of the memo pulled out with the, the specific language uh, around persistent identifiers. And so the first part is talking about collecting and making publicly available metadata associated with scholarly publications and data. And um, that um, some minimum set of metadata should be included. And that is um, authors and co-author names, affiliations and sources of funding, 
referencing digital persistent identifiers for each of those. So, um, you know, that's talking about um, persistent identifiers for researchers, for the authors, persistent identifiers for the their affiliations, which are organizations, and then also persistent identifiers for, for those awards, those sources of funding. It also talks about um, that we need to collect or make sure that there's a digital persistent identifier for each of the research outputs for those publications and the data as well. The second part um, goes back to persistent identifiers for researchers and um, says that agencies should instruct federally funded researchers to obtain a digital persistent identifier that meets the common core standards as defined in the NSPM 33 implementation guidance. So that's another connection with NSPM 33. And then last, it asks agencies to assign unique digital persistent identifiers to all scientific R&D awards and intramural research protocols. And so there's a lot there. <laughs> this is a relatively uh, you know, newer uh, space for a lot of agencies. There are some agencies who have been working with persistent identifiers for many years, but um, it's also kind of a, a newer area. So on the next slide, um, OSTP kind of um, had a little bit longer uh, implementation timeline for this section of the memo. And so it asked agencies to um, have updates to their public access plan to address this section by the end of 2024. It asked that agencies publish any related policies um, by the end of 2026. And then for those um, policies to become effective and, and kind of fully implemented by the end of 2027. So, you know, like I said, I think there's a spectrum where agencies, you know, some agencies are already doing a lot of this work and then some agencies will, will probably take the, the whole timeline. So those are the memos in a nutshell. I know it was very brief, um, but also wanted to kind of mention some of the benefits that, that we see kind of from agencies and using persistent identifiers. So if you go to the next slide, um, you know, really th this um, kind of research life cycle, this is not every place that persistent identifiers come in, but that, you know, you, you can just kind of see that persistent identifiers can really be used all the way out throughout the research life cycle, starting at the very beginning. And from the you know, US government perspective, I think um, PIDs can really support um, a lot of different things. So research integrity and proper disclosure of information. They can help with you know, researcher and organization disambiguation. Um, they can help ensure that people receive proper credit. They can help ease administrative burden and help with reporting. They can enable broader discovery and making um, you know, connections throughout the research life cycle with all of these different aspects and also help understand kind of the, the broader impact of, of the funding that we're providing. And so I just wanted to show a couple of examples um, about kind of um, space where this work is already happening. So first, um, starting with using persistent identifiers for research integrity and proper disclosure, um, and shout out to my NIH colleagues who um, provide this wonderful um, platform, Science CV, which you can use to create those common um, uh, the, those disclosure forms that I had talked about earlier, the bio, biographical sketch and the current and pending support. And so um, they already uh, had kind of had an integration with ORCID. And so you can use the information in your ORCID record to kind of populate the, those um, forms, which is really wonderful. And in the, the new common forms also be able to provide um, that, that ORCID ID, the persistent identifier for researchers that, that are now included um, in those common forms. So on the next slide, um, you know, persistent identifiers can help uh, with reporting and easing burden. And I know um, there are a number of agencies already doing this. I, this is just one example um, from Department of Energy. So there's an expectation that any other research results um, that come from DOE funding need to, need to be reported to DOE through um, our system eLink. And so if you already have a DOI, for example, for a journal article accepted manuscript that, that you're submitting to us, you can provide us that DOI and um, we can auto-populate all of the metadata that's associated with that DOI. So it makes it a lot easier to kind of report those research outputs. Next slide. Also, you know, I think one of the, the incredibly powerful parts of persistent identifiers is how they can all be interconnected and, and you know, how all of this information can be interconnected. And so that's one thing that we're working toward at Department of Energy is basically for as much of the metadata describing um, the information that we have, we want persistent identifiers associated as much as possible. 
And so here's one example of a data set record that we have assigned a DOI to. Um, there are authors of this data set record. There's ORCID IDs for those authors, which is great. Um, some areas that we're working towards, we're not quite there yet, we're working towards kind of having ROAR IDs for um, all of the organizations, for the author affiliations, for the research organizations, the sponsoring and funding organizations, um, we do have an award or grant DOI service that's a pilot service right now. So, you know, we would love to, in addition to our kind of internal award numbers, also have, for example, an award DOI. And then of course, we want to connect this to any associated research output. So this data set references a publication. So we've got that publication DOI. It's cited by a, a, another data set. We've got that DOI. It also references software. The software doesn't yet have a DOI, but that's also something that we provide and, and are looking to do. So you can just see how all of this information is interconnected. And then um, on the next slide, I have kind of one more example. Um, this is an award uh, record. So, so using the Crossref Grant uh, DOI schema, we um, have assigned, uh, this is one of the DOE user facilities, the Joint Genome Institute. And so we've worked with them to assign a DOI um, that, uh, to the award that they provided to use their facility. So you can see in that award DOI metadata, um, there's an ORCID ID for the lead investigator. There's a ROAR ID for the awarding organization. And then this award has already, um, a, a, a publication has come from this award. And uh, uh, Joint Genome Institute has um, instructed folks to include the award DOI in the acknowledgements and, and funding section. And they also ask that their ROAR ID is included as well. So you, you have both of those connections there. And then next slide, I think, um, is my last slide. I, I also just think, you know, I, I know there are a lot of funding organizations that are thinking about, you know, um, portfolio analytics and understanding the impact of, of their funding. And there's already a lot of tremendous work that is being done in that space. But I think persistent identifiers can be really helpful um, to help with all of this dis disambiguation, data cleanup, things like that, that, that go into that process. So. I just think they're a, a tremendous value uh, there as well. So with that, I just want to say thank you. And I, I believe I'm handing it back to Shona. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Carly. Um, next slide, please. So Carly has provided this big picture for the US government and some of the expectations or the funding agencies. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to transition to the PID providers. So I'm going to start with ORCID and then hand over to Amanda French with ROAR afterwards. So that way we can kind of explain to you a bit more of the detail, but hopefully not too much detail because um, we can get technical real fast. Uh, so we'll, we'll spare you from that. Um, but we'll each provide our overview of each of the technical services. So hopefully you'll have a fulsome picture of this puzzle that we're all putting together, all these pieces. So um, when we first thought of this webinar, we thought it'd be mostly the agencies attending, but we can also see um, the U.S. agencies, but we can tell by the registration, we have lots of international um, groups that have joined as well. So hopefully this is relevant and resonating with you. Uh, we've also noticed a lot of U.S. universities, which is wonderful because it's best to prepare all of your researchers to have their ORCID ID so they know the ROAR ID of your institution. Make sure they understand what a DOI is for their data sets, for everything that we're going to describe. So hopefully this is all helpful. Um, and then please get in touch with us if you have questions. We do have the 20 minutes afterwards. Anyway. Most of you are familiar with ORCID, but those of you who are not, I'm just gonna do a quick overview. Um, so as Carly discussed, ORCID is part of the technical infrastructure to support research and researchers, the research community globally. So ORCID's role is to help researchers uniquely identify themselves because some researchers have the same name. Um, and it's important to know who should get credit for the work or the funding. So ORCID is an independent nonprofit organization. We cannot be bought or sold. And that's a question we get often. We are independent, cannot be sold. Um, research, we are researcher focused and community governed. So we're, we're governed by a board of directors that represents our membership. Uh, we launched in 2012 and our identity, our ID service has been globally adopted and across all disciplines of research. And we're really proud of that. Okay, next slide, please. So as Kelly described, ORCID provides the unique ID number for researchers, and we work together with our uh, other PID colleagues to create this PID infrastructure um, 
that is interoperable and mutually supportive. Um, so we're technically coordinated, but you'll notice from our slides across the different organizations, we haven't actually developed a common infographic yet to describe this technical infrastructure, and we're all working on it. So it's in production, we're, we're working, um, but from each of our presentations, let us know which infographic you like best, um, and, uh, and, and it'll help us finalize and agree to one. Um, next slide, please. So we have the unique identifier for researchers, which is on the left here, the PID for researchers, um, but you can see the relationship between the different organizations, so different universities or research institutions, publishers, funding agencies. And so we, we make sure we have this infrastructure that exchanges data between all of our systems and it's essentially real time, which is great. So when a researcher submits to a publisher, submits a manuscript to a publisher, they include their ORCID ID. And when it's published, the publisher writes that citation, including the Crossref DOI to the ORCID record. And then that way the university who also has their system stinked gets the new citation from the ORCID record to update your system. And so we've timed this. It's about 40 minutes from the time of public Occasion to updating the university system. I'm pretty confident your researchers are not letting the universities know of the new publication inside of 40 minutes. So hopefully this makes your life easier and also the quality of the data because it's really reusing the data from the source, which in this situation is the publisher. So there's also that same workflow from the funding agencies. So this way they, they write the citation and provide a unique PID for this, the funding that's just been awarded to the researcher, it's written to the ORCID record and can update your system. And then for people who hire researchers, they employ researchers, universities, research institutes, agencies, such, um, when you write the employment data to their ORCID record, it will then update the systems at the funders and the publishers that have a relationship with your researchers. So really it's just creating this mutually supportive environment. We help each other with the data researchers just populate, the, the systems pre-populate the forms like Carly described. That way they don't have to enter the data manually. And it also improves the quality of the data. So that way the administrators who receive the forms have hopefully a lot less work to do in correcting the data before moving it forward in their workflows. All right, next slide, please. So with this technical infrastructure, just to focus on ORCID a little bit, this is how we do it. So we provide three services. So first is the unique ID. And so I've listed mine here and I'm gonna show you a couple examples in a bit. So that's the unique ID that we assign to a person, a researcher, and it's free of charge to people. To qualify for an ORCID ID, you have to be a human being over the age of 18. So it can be anyone. So this includes citizen scientists, patients who wanna participate in research, anyone. Second, with this ID, we provide a profile or a record, whatever you want to call it, but it's really a space to capture your professional research activities. And I'll show you an example next. And third is this is how we create that technical infrastructure that exchanges data with all the different systems is an API. And if you want to get into that, that's a whole nother webinar. So, all right, next slide, please, Amanda. So here's an example for you. So you can see in the top left, uh, there's my ORCID ID, and here's an example of my ORCID record. And we've just started to launch a new program. You see the source of my employment has that green check mark. We call that a trust marker. And that means the source of that data was the organization that has that green check mark. So we identify the source of the data. And this really will hopefully help with the trust and transparency of data and that, that, that the spirit of data integrity. All right, next slide, please. Carly Robinson, who just spoke before me, here's Carly's ORCID ID and, and then her profile here. We're gonna work on those trust markers, right, Carly? <laughs> Thank you. And then next slide, please. Um, so Carly mentioned the, um, the public access memo. Uh, so here is Dr. Alondra Nelson uh, with her ORCID ID and her profile. So Dr. Nelson was the interim head of OSTP when the public memo, public access memo was published, was released. And so colloquially, it's known as the Nelson memo. And so we really do attribute and really recognize Dr. Nelson's uh, leadership in this area. So it's very exciting. So it's not just us who are participating proactively in the PID environment that have ORCID IDs and profiles. It is leadership in policy areas that also have ORCID IDs and recognize their, their importance in the work. Great. Uh, next slide, please. 
So when these significant memos that Carly described came out, you know, ORCID, we were taken aback in a really happy, positive way. Um, but we took a moment to think about it and how ORCID could best support all of these new exciting initiatives. And so we wrote this blog post. It's probably our longest blog post because there's a lot of substance in these policies for us to address. Um, so Nabil just shared the link to the blog post. So we hope that's a comprehensive response from ORCID uh, and just so much support and appreciation for these policies. And we're really excited to work with everyone here who has to also respond to these policies, to adapt uh, their systems, to prepare their researchers. You know, we're here to support you. So just please reach out to ORCID. I've included my um, email address, but also just reach out. It's no trouble. All right, next slide, please. So quickly, these are my last two slides. So the, the key point, so we've got the full blog post if you want to read a full sum, but just to boil it down. So the public access memo, you heard Carly describe that it is asking for researchers to clearly identify themselves so that the right people get credit for the work. And then on the other side of that public access is people reading the work. So if they're reading this work and they want to know who wrote this, who is this person, they can go to their ORCID ID, to their record, and then see their, their other publications, their funding, their employer, and just have a better sense of the source of this research. Um, and again, that's really to help build the trust and transparency in science. And then last slide. Then when it comes to the research security, you know, big picture, um, again, it's important that researchers are uniquely identified so we understand who exactly we're talking about. Because the reality is there are a lot of researchers who share the name, it's the same name, it's, it's shocking. Um, so having that ID is really important. Um, second, that profile that I showed you that lists all your publications and your funding, this is a really easy way to disclose your affiliations. And that's part of what's being asked in these policies. So ORCID, we've made it really easy. Um, you know, you can, the researcher can set the visibility of each line item to either fully public, only trusted organizations, which will count, when it comes to the integrated systems, like with DOE and NSF and NIH, um, or private, and, you know, and they don't want that shown. And the researcher can change the status of their data at any time, it's under their full control. Um, then of course the technical infrastructure, you know, as Carly mentioned, the pre-populating and automating of data, really to help reduce the administrative burden for researchers, but also the staff as well, right? Um, so we support that. Um, and then, Within the guidance document for research security, um, there is a list of criteria for an organization who can provide a unique persistent identifier for researchers. And we were so pleased to see that we do qualify for uh, to provide the persistent identifier for researchers in this context. So, so we're very keen to do so. And I think that is my last slide, Amanda. Am I passing it over to you now? And if you have any other questions about ORCID, let me know. Wonderful, thank you so much, Shauna, and uh, thank you, Carly, as well, for that wonderful overview. So I am Amanda French. I am the Technical Community Manager for ROAR, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about ROAR, the Research Organization Registry. Um, I wanted to mention, before I go on to talking specifically about ROAR, um, calling back to a couple of uh, excerpts that Carly showed from specifically the OSTP memo. Uh, I'll read you these excerpts. Federal agencies should, consistent with applicable law, collect and make publicly available appropriate metadata associated with scholarly publications and data resulting from federally funded research to the extent possible at the time of deposit in a public access repository. Such metadata should include, at a minimum, all author and co-author names, affiliations, and sources of funding referencing digital persistent identifiers as appropriate. So I think we all know that ORCID is what is commonly used for especially authors and co-authors. And I just want to point out that uh, ROAR is being used also for author affiliations and sources of funding in the sense of funding organizations. Um, also, uh, Carly mentioned DOIs for, uh, for grants, the awards that those organization those organizations make and Isaac will talk to you a little bit about that. But that's Roar's role in this is helping to identify those author affiliations and organizations that provide funding. And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about why um, that guidance is issued in this memo. Um, the public should be able to identify 
says the memo, which federal agencies support given investments in science, the scientists who conduct that research, and the extent to which peer review is conducted. And this is something that I just wholeheartedly endorse as an American citizen. And I think the key point that sometimes people miss if they're not familiar with persistent identifiers is that if you don't have persistent identifiers, specifically free and open persistent identifiers like ORCID and like ROAR, that critical information that the public deserves can get lost because information travels so much between systems. So if you are transparently identifying um, affiliations and funding only with text strings, that may not be sufficient because um, that information will get lost or corrupted as it travels between systems. So that being said, let's, uh, let's look specifically at Roar. So the research organization registry, uh, also known as Roar, is a global curated community-led registry of open persistent identifiers for research organizations. Uh, you can see here the elements of a Roar record. This is for Los Alamos National Laboratory. The, the identifier itself is uh, circled in purple. It is a globally unique identifier. It is entirely persistent. It will always continue to resolve. Um, and you can see that there are a number of um, terrific and useful uh, metadata elements in a Roar record that are attached to that persistent identifier. So we have the organization type, we have additional names it goes by, including acronyms, uh, we have its location, the geolocation can be very, very useful for all kinds of purposes. Uh, we have uh, Roar records mapped to other identifiers that are used to identify organizations, and that's all stored within the Roar record itself. We have the organization's website. And we have um, quite detailed relationships to parent organizations, child organizations, and laterally related organizations. Um, we currently have, actually, I think it's over 106,000, maybe even over 107,000 records in the Roar Registry. And we have a very, very busy um, curation queue in which we are adding new records all the time. This is a typical way Roar is used. I really take Shauna's point about needing a common infographic about how all the persistent identifiers relate to one another. Uh, but meanwhile, this is uh, what we use to describe how Roar generally works. So there is a system, such as some of the ones that Carly showed, uh, in which um, you know a user is filling out a form, usually. And when it comes time to choose an organization, uh, the Roar technology can power a pick list uh, to, where that user can just choose an organization. Um, then that organization is stored within the system. Uh, it's added to metadata. That metadata can be shared. And that means that the systems that can harvest that metadata can link research outputs to organizations. So in this sense, you know, Roar is really essential for all kinds of purposes, connecting organizations to research in many different, many different ways promoting better metadata quality, assisting and tracking compliance, you know, is this institution, um, you know, meeting our standards for its uh, for, for research. Um, and again, as Sean, both Shauna and Carly mentioned, it can contribute to reducing administrative burden for both researchers and organization staff. Roar is a, a key part of DOI metadata. Um, we have here a couple of things. Of course, we're going to hear both from Crossref and Datasite. Uh, the Datasite API allows you to track which identifiers are used um, to identify organizations. And um, Datasite has been accepting Roar IDs for several years. And you can see that um, for affiliation metadata, meaning which organization is this author affiliated with, um, Roar is um, accountable for about 80% of that. And then that other 19 0.6% is grid IDs, which is the um, was a, a sort of a defunct organizational identifier, or uh, mostly defunct, that passed its seed data along to Roar. Um, similarly, for funders, um, when Roar is used to identify funders, we do have the Crossref Funder Registry identifying most funders, um, but Roar is uh, increasingly taking over that job and is going to be doing even more of that in the future. Um, we have on the right sort of what Roar looks like in uh, a Crossref DOI metadata. And of course, any system that pulls in DOI metadata is also going to pull in all of this information as well. And so that means that when you have a DOI that is linked to a publication or a data set or even a piece of software or a, or a grant award, um, if that metadata includes a Roar ID, all of that terrific, clean, consistent organization information will come along with that metadata 
as well. All ROARS, data, all ROARS metadata and services are entirely free and open, as you can see here. We also change and modify ROAR records at no cost. ROAR does work a little bit differently from ORCID in that ORCIDs are not necessarily themselves responsible for their ROAR records. Really, anyone can request a change or an addition to ROAR, and we evaluate that um, with our curation board and with our uh, curation team. So um, we are all of the information in a war record is kind of publicly verifiable. Um, so it doesn't need to be maintained necessarily by that organization. Although of course, in practice, most organizations do uh, take responsibility for uh, making sure that the information in their record is correct. All of that data is CC0, it's publicly available. Uh, the whole data set of ROAR is downloadable in JSON and CSV. We have very nice web landing pages and a searchable web uh, version of the registry. And all of our tool tools and services are free. And I think that this is really, really important uh, to keep ROAR free and easy to use because both, both cost and difficulty of use in PIDs will present barriers to widespread PID adoption. And that drastically reduces the benefits of these persistent identifiers. You know, the more widely adopted persistent identifiers are, the more useful they are. If you're wondering how and why ROAR is free, uh, here's how. We are an initiative, not an organization ourselves. We are not a membership organization. We are financially sustained by the California Digital Library, by Crossref, and by Datasite. And as well, we are governed by them by a memorandum of understanding and by a board. And just like ORCID, we cannot be sold. We cannot be transferred to a commercial entity. And this ensures that uh, ROAR services and tools will remain free. So here are some key systems that use ROAR. Um, ROAR is the preferred identifier in Crossref and in Datasite and in ORCID, um, and similarly other infrastructure services uh, such as Counter for tracking journal metrics and uh, the open access switchboard rely on ROAR. Uh, national level systems around the world are using ROAR, incorporating ROAR. Uh, we have a number of large knowledge graphs and indexes that use ROAR. An increasing number of generalist repository systems are using ROAR, Zenodo, Dryad, Open Science Framework. Um, and then publishing, publishing systems are adopting ROAR. They're a bit slower to do that, but we're seeing more and more of that adoption. US federal agencies are already using ROAR. Um, DOE OSTI is our um, sort of poster child for ROAR adoption. They're doing a great deal of wonderful work, um, including ROAR in their um, systems and being involved in ROAR community activities. But other agencies are also using ROAR um, and involved in our community. Uh, many, many of the US federal agencies, really especially in the last year, have begun really just starting by working with us to make sure that their agencies are properly represented in ROAR. So the USGS, uh, NOAA, uh, Department of Defense um, sort of um, repository uh, team has been working with us to make sure that those organizations are well represented. So one of the questions that we get a lot about ROAR is how do we manage organizational hierarchy? We wrote an explainer about this a few months ago um, that's uh, linked to from here. Um, or that you can find on the ROAR blog. And when we shared this, I just thought it was very interesting. I shared it on LinkedIn and immediately got this response um, from the deputy director of a, a national level research facility uh, who pointed out that ROAR and other PIDs are improving our ability to associate research outputs with the family tree of the producing organization. And so this is, um, is with the D3D National Fusion Facility, um, which is here in this particular family tree for the Department of Energy. And I'll point out too, um, that this is uh, a record or a series of records that we have been working on um, in conjunction with DOE over the last year in particular uh, to make sure it's accurate and has a, has a good level of granularity so that we can use these to uh, associate research outputs with all of the child organizations of the DOE. Um, so this is my last slide and it's uh, perhaps a bit unusual and I want to talk a little bit about what I mean here. So for me, and I don't want to overstate things, but the OSTP memo and our current moment are historic. They really are historic events. And I know that sounds a bit exaggerated, but it, it's really honestly how I feel. 
Um, the OSTP memo uh, is encouraging the use of PIDs because it recognizes that they are essential infrastructure. And what it reminds me of is an event that I learned about in school <laughs> as a probably middle school, junior high, high school, something like that. The 1869 meeting of the track ceremony celebrating the completion of the transcontinental railroad in the United States. So before that date, there was a railroad system in the Western United States, there was a railroad system in the Eastern United States, but the two were not connected. And then on May 10th, 1869, there was a ceremony to celebrate the joining up of these two systems into a single railroad system that enabled Americans to travel all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast, from the East Coast to the West Coast. Leland Stanford, after whom Stanford University is named, drove a golden spike at the point marked by the flag in this image, uh, which was on top of Promontory Summit in what was then Utah Territory, joining the Central Pacific Railroad to the Union Pacific Railroad. And for me, uh, it's very clear that PIDs enable metadata to connect and to travel in just the same way, not just within a state, not just within a region, and in fact, not just within the United States, but globally. We need those connections, and I look forward to seeing them created and strengthened in the coming years. Okay. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Isaac from CrossRec. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I'll talk about those connections now. Uh, my name is Isaac Farley. I'm the uh, technical support manager here at Crossref, and I, like I said, I'm going to discuss uh, Crossref's role in U.S. guidance and research. So, next slide. Let's talk a bit about Crossref. Um, so, at Crossref, we're a small team based around the world, supporting nearly 20,000 members and affiliated organizations across 160 countries, universities. Research institutes and publishers are our largest group of members, um, but we also support funders who can and are joining to register grants. Like Datasite, Crossref is more than just a registration agency. We see ourselves as the center of what we call the research nexus, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, more here shortly. We have metadata records of more than 152 million scholarly content items, and we support our members in registering their metadata since we know that good quality metadata and good quality research benefits all of us. Um, so we, we provide uh, that support to them. Um, and as you can see from this slide, we've recently exceeded 1 billion queries per month on average from our metadata users. Um, so lots of users and those users, just, just to name uh, some of the things they do, their archives and repositories, research councils, data centers, patent offices, lab and diagnostic suppliers, educational tools, so a very far reach um, with Crossref metadata. Next slide. So you've heard me use the word metadata. You've heard us talk about metadata. What, what, is, it, what is metadata and what are, what are we talking about? In the context of Crossref, metadata is information about publication and other research objects, including grants, uh, which we then make available for for thousands of other parties to use in tools and services that they provide to the community. Um, so we have minimal uh, metadata requirements uh, that we need to support because we need to support a variety of publication practices across our member, member base. And so basic metadata requirements include things like titles, authors, publication dates, ISSNs, ISBNs, but we also collect reference list, funding, data, ORCID IDs, license data, clinical trial information, abstracts, and then um, and, and data about the relationships between those items, um, which creates this big web and connection um, that, again, I'll talk about more as I, as I work through this. Um, we also collect information about er errata, retractions, and updates through a service we call Crossmark. Um, so collectively we ask our members to send us as much metadata as possible and that and and that metadata should be accurate and clean uh, the more comprehensive the metadata is the more likely that content will be discovered and disseminated um, like amanda talked about and the value of crossref doesn't just come from the doi or just the metadata registered registered for a doi it comes from the links and relationships that that metadata captures that's what we call this research nexus that I mentioned previously. Um, those connections between authors, funding, funders, research, org research institutions, publications, and other research outputs is what we see as being the real, um, the, the, the real solid part of, of, of this ecosystem, that web of, of connections. 
At Crossref, we now deliberately operate as openly scholarly foundational infrastructure, making those 152 million plus records that I talked about before, plus all of their connections and relationships, we make those visible and trackable through our open metadata and APIs. And we collaborate with a wide range of different organizations, as you could see on this call today, um, to capture those, uh, those relationships. So we find that metadata, including those persistent identifiers and relationships between the objects, is really the foundation of the research nexus and is critical to openly and sustainably fulfilling the OSTP public access memo. Next slide. So a little little history, and, and Amanda mentioned Posey before, but in November 2020, Crossref adopted the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, what we call Posey. Uh, it's a set of concrete com commitments that an organization can make to build trust about its accountability, funding, and, and protection of community interests. And so let, let me tell you a little bit about how we see that playing out. We, be we believe that Posey builds critical trust in our organization in Crossref and in our, in our infrastructure. And by making our infrastructure open, if for some reason we stop meeting the needs of all of you, of our community, the community can take that open source code, that open data and build something else with it. We think adopting Posey makes collaboration easier in the future and makes all of these connections stronger. So open science relies on many opens, open metadata, open infrastructure, open governance, um, metadata for publications, grants, research outputs, illuminates these connections between funders and their outcomes. Uh, the, the metadata runs on infrastructure that all of us provide, Crossref, ORCID, ROAR, and Datasite, and all that infrastructure is open. But to meet the goals of the OSTP public access memo, we need more adoption, not just from US federal funding, but globally, bringing significant benefits to the, the research, research ecosystem as a whole. Um, let me drop in a, uh, in chat, I'll drop in a, uh, oh, some, Adam, thanks for adding the, the link to Posey. That's what I was gonna drop in, thanks. Um, next slide. Um, the reality of all this is not all the tools we need to make this easy and connected are currently in place. Um, many of the funders that we work with are still early in their adoption journey and implementation um, by stakeholders is patchy across across Crossref. Much of, uh, much of the registration process require, require, uh, relies on third-party tools. So coordinating support for metadata across these tools is important. For example, not all funders have particular infrastructure and expertise in generating XML that's um, formatted to the Crossref uh, schema. Some of those funders use third-party tools to collect metadata about their grant proposals, something like Proposal Central is an example, um, but these funders need to make sure that the tools can generate XML in the proper schema and then talk to the Crossref system. So there's, it's a big uh, onboarding and learning curve there. Um, and so Crossref, uh, along with support from Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, have built a simple UI to help manually handle the registration of these, these grant records. And I'll, I'll go ahead and, if for those of you who'd like to check out this, this UI, I'll post it in the, um, in the chat. So still a lot of work to do. Next slide. Um, here's how we see uh, an ideal workflow for funders and publishers to work with the existing infrastructure. So first, funders join Crossref uh, to register DOIs for grants and awards. Those funders collect ORCID IDs uh, from their researchers and ROAR IDs from the institutions. Um, the funders deposit the metadata and register Crossref DOIs for those grants and awards. At the same time, they update awardees ORCID records with Crossref, um, and uh, then the grantees produce research object outputs like data, protocols, preprints, articles, what Carly was talking about before. Um, these objects are then registered with Crossref and Datasite, and the DOIs are created by the publisher or the repository member to include ORCID IDs, ROAR IDs, and other key metadata, those things that I talked about uh, previously, abstracts, license information, references, and on and on. So once that metadata is registered with Crossref, we do a boatload of processing and matching on our end as well. 
um, examples of that processing, we are matching preprints to their version of record journal articles. We are adding relationships and notifying members about those relationships. We're converting funding acknowledgements to free text uh, and free text to open funder registry IDs and names. And we're doing a lot of this now and continue to refine and build more and more on top of that. And what do we end up with there in the seventh step on the far right is we end up with grant records that have Crossref IDs. They're now a part of the scholarly record and anyone can get them out of our open APIs along with their metadata. And Crossref and Datasite are always provided, are always um, committed to providing open metadata and safeguarding our commitments by being members of POSI. So um, we we have adopted the, those principles and will continue to meet um, uh, meet them. Uh, let me post, a, we did a blog like ORCID about how we're meeting this. And let me go ahead and post that in the chat as well. Um, if you'd like additional reading beyond what I'm talking about in the slides. Um, so now that the metadata is registered with us, how can you use it? How can members of the public get that metadata out uh, and retrieve it and use it? Um, all of us, Crossref, Datasite, ORCID, ROAR, we all have open APIs, which we've talked about. I won't go into a lot of details about those APIs because it gets technical really quickly. As Shauna said, that's a whole other um, that's a whole other webinar. Um, but these screenshots on the on the slide, uh, or I should say, next slide. Uh, my apologies, I transitioned there. Um, this, the screenshots on this slide here um, are from Crossref, Crossref Metadata Search and ORCID Search, and these are how humans can interact with our metadata if they're uh, looking to get small batches of information about our metadata. Um, since I'm here to talk about Crossref, let me focus on Crossref services, so, so let's do that in the next slide. Um, so there's, there's a variety of different ways to get metadata from us. Um, and anyone can get it, and it's it's freely available. Um, like I said on in, in the last slide, we do have interfaces for people. Search.crossref.org is one of them, um, but we also have uh, APIs for machines. If you're if you're uh, looking to retrieve large volumes of metadata, like I said, we have over 152 million records. Um, machines can help in retrieving that metadata. So we have a REST API that returns that metadata in JSON. Uh, JSON. Uh, we also have XML API, and we have an open URL um, that's mostly used for library link resolvers. Um, our REST API uh, again has metadata for has complete metadata records for all 152 million plus uh, records that are registered with us. We have three different pools that that our members can use to access that metadata, and we also uh, make available an annual public data file that includes all of that metadata. It's a very large file. It was almost 200 gigabytes this year. Um, and we provide different different ways to download uh, that information and then iterate uh, to get a, a full uh, list of the metadata records. And I will, again, post in a blog post about retrieving um, that public data file and working with our APIs if that's something you're interested in. So last slide here, Amanda. In, in summary, um, as foundation foundational open infrastructure, Crossref metadata, and the services that we provide really make the research outputs that I've talked about easier to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. Um, Crossref DOIs are really citation identifiers. They provide a persistent link to the digital location of research content, which can take many forms, including journal articles, conference proceedings, reports, grants, and much more. And we're always looking to add more record types in the future. Um, all of the metadata of our 152 million records is openly available to all of us um, via our APIs, via our search interface, via other uh, tools that we provide to the community to not only use, but to build upon. And at Crossref, we see our vision uh, uh, as being um, a place that creates rich and reusable uh, metadata, uh, an open network of relationships connecting research, research organization, people, things, and actions. And we can't do this alone. We need all of your help. Uh, so uh, we definitely see this as a collaboration. Um, thanks again for this opportunity to speak to all of you, and thanks for your attention. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to our colleagues at Datasite uh, to hear about how Datasite is supporting U.S. research. Thanks. Well, 
Thanks, Isaac. Um, yeah, so I am happy to uh, represent DataSite on this panel, and uh, I'll keep this brief uh, with an eye on the time. So uh, my name is Ali, and I'm the project lead of the Implementing Fair Workflow project at DataSite. And um, uh, yeah, so it's one word about DataSite as an organization, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so DataSite is funded uh, back in 2009, and it's a global nonprofit uh, membership organization uh, working with over 2,800 repositories in the world to provide DOIs for research outputs and resources. So DataSite is also an open scholarly uh, infrastructure organization. We have already emphasized this many, multiple times how important it is to be open and uh, uh, openly governed, openly uh, share our resources, uh, metadata. Um, so I'm not going to reiterate that. I saw someone in the chat previously asking well, whether there are other PID organizations. Yes, there are many of them out there, but you will not find as many that are open like uh, the ones present here on this panel. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so the data community is committed to our funding uh, principles and work together with our members to ensure that, sorry, I'm still on the previous slide. This is not very much information on the slide, but I'm just going to go through this. A very important message is that uh, we work together to ensure the uh, research outputs and resources are openly available and connected uh, so that their reuse can advance knowledge across and between disciplines uh, so our vision is connecting research, advancing knowledge. This encapsulates our collective effort as a community to bring together disparate pieces of research, research and bring rigor to the scholarly record by making outputs and resources findable, citable, connected, and reused globally. Um, next slide, please. So the new guidance from the OSTP rightfully uh, focuses on scope beyond the published articles. Um, well. Of course, articles are still uh, very much uh, the uh, you know the monumental output um, of, of research. Uh, this is, uh, goes through traditional peer review and editorial process, very rigorous records. However, uh, a major obstacle is that uh, current research articles offer very little underlying information or a mechanism to easily link to the experimental design, the research data, and the analytical tools that were used to generate these reports and outcomes. So this is what we are addressing in the implementing fair workflow projects that I'm leading. So we will map all of the identifiable outputs throughout the various stages of research lifecycle and the craft workflows and technical integrations to support the open and fair sharing practices. So the OSTP guidance make a clear statement regarding the research data stating that uh, scientific data on click that's where it happens being shared in the research lifecycle. That's underlying peer-reviewed uh, scholarly publication. Um, another click, please. <laughs> this is anime, sorry, I didn't think this through. Um, resulting from federally funded research, the click, to be made freely available and uh, publicly accessible by the by default at the time of publication. So this provides an opportunity for research institutes and funders to formally create uh, incentives and make it normative as part of the research process. So next slide, please. Um, the data schema and the technical infrastructure is designed to support identification and citation of research data and many other types of resources involved uh, in the research process. The resource type property is required uh, when registering a data site DOI required in the, in the data metadata schema. So here's the current list of values that can be used for the resource type general attribute. Um, this is a controlled list, but we do have this other uh, tag if it is like 20 something resource type cannot satisfy your use case, you can put another on it and we do have a sub attribute to specify what that is and that is free text. Um, so you can use uh, this uh, free text uh, 
based resource like uh, uh, you can use this on um, text based resources like uh, preprints and conference papers as well as other type of resource like uh, software and physical objects. Uh, you can represent any resource type um, here. Depends on what's useful for you. Next slide. So the chain of connection specified in the Nelson memo that I was just mentioning, this like a data and article and funder link, this is just one of the many ways in which these research entities are connected. The research really is a graph or a nexus um, in uh, cross, uh, how, how Crossref describes it. Make it uh, so what make it tangible is the various person identifiers and their associated metadata and their connection in a standard machine processable way. Uh, so that allows one to answer a question like how influential is certain institute based on the usage statistic of the data sets and papers published by researchers affiliated with or founded by them. So these are very complicated queries, but they are actualizable by uh, full and rich metadata. And, uh, and the possibility really is endless. And best of all, this corpus of identifying metadata is openly accessible via various open APIs. Um, next slide. But if you are not a fan of waiting through API documentations, um, data styles provides a discovery portal powered by Elasticsearch and uh, GraphQL, uh, GraphQL API where anyone can go and search for the entire data metadata catalog as well as several other paid resources. So currently on data commons, you can find individual and aggregated data on work, people, organization and repository, uh, repository level. We, uh, we are actively exploring more useful ways to represent the data, like on a project level, which is also something we're working on in the Fair Workflow project. So the next slide. Um, so if you go to data commons, you'll see these, this shown on the interface as search, uh, as search tabs. This is where the world of pits collide. Um, Next slide. So we just break it down a little bit uh, to see how you search by people, how you can search by people, organization, and repository on data comments. Isn't so data the way you use data comments is not as intuitive as you use Google because when you go on a, like you know a, a proprietary uh, repository page, you kind of expect uh, the data, the corpus of data is what's hosted on this website, but comments kind of like is consolidating a lot of data from different places. So um, so you have really have to pay attention when using it. Um, so next slide. Uh, starting with the people search, the people search used ORCID API to power it and the create and the create option available uh, through the ORCID API. So here you can search by name or ORCID ID. The next slide. Um, data set researcher profile provides insights into the data level metrics by researcher. So this it shows information from the ORCID record of the person, including name, related links, other identifiers, other profile and locations such as that. And the records show uh, the employment and aggregated citations, views, and downloads, uh, and accessibility achievement of the individual. Well, my citation number is not as impre impressive, but uh, there are like a, a researchers that are very 100% like, uh, open and uh, have a lot of citations and views. The next slide. And whenever my ORCID ID or anyone's ORCID ID is included in the DOI metadata of a shared work, be a data set, a preprint, or presentation slide deck, this work will fall into the related work list displayed at the bottom of the researcher profile page. So this work can be filtered by publication year, work type, license, registration agency, field of science, uh, uh, and uh, co-authors. The next slide. Uh, so, so when you search for organization, this search is powered by the Roar API. Next slide. Uh, the organization in the result page can be filtered by country. This is extremely useful. And the organization type. Next slide. Uh, the top half of the uh, organization profile display information from Roar uh, and also supplement by this organizational profile. Um, including related links, other identifier, geolocation, country, organization type, 
also the type of membership the organization holds with data site. And following that is a related work section, similar to the researcher profile work, where a organizational raw ID has been included in the metadata as a creator or contributor will be listed in this uh, related work list. It also include a cross rep funder ID of the organization uh, if, that, if that's included in the work metadata. Um, and another way to be included in this list if you are uh, have a data set organizational profile in Fabrica if you're a data set member. And this is a small subsection of, uh, of the organization that we list here. So uh, next slide. And we go to the in the repository type tab. This is where you can search and retrieve repository metadata. Uh, metric link uh, and link out to see which work related to the repository. And this is powered by the restrict data, uh, like uh, technical infrastructure. And next slide. Um, so this you can where you can search um, repository profile that exists in data site as well as restrict data. Um, next slide. So the repository dashboard display this um, uh, this general information about this repository, uh, including summarized metrics of the work related to that repository. And now the chart at the bottom is again cut off. It's not big enough uh, to, uh, to display information sourced from data site metadata of the DOI registered by that repository. And there, uh, next slide. And, and there's with one click, you can find all of the related work that is um, re registered by that repository. So all of this cross-discipline, cross-institute, cross-border searches are empowered by the open metadata behind all of these various APIs, oh, not API, sorry, PIDs, PIDs, um, and the comments only provide a glimpse of what can be done with this metadata the potential of the APIs and more importantly, the wider community engagement and uh, will continue to drive adoption and innovative use of all of these tools to actualize the value of, of in open infrastructure. Next slide. Um, my last slide in summary, uh, adopting and implementing open infrastructure like PIS and metadata workflow is critical to make research fair and open up reach insights. Um, that's ideal I support identification of diverse type of scholarly resources and works seamlessly together with other major PID systems. And as a global community of key stakeholders, enablers, open and connected research that shares a vision and collectively build and spread best practices. So uh, yeah, that's my um, overview and happy to answer any questions about data science. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you to all the presenters. We are a bit over time, but we do have uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, so let me stop sharing and I'll see if anyone has their hand raised. I must say that I, uh, I think Datacite Commons is a really wonderful example of what can be done with PIDs, um, bringing all of that information in together into a really nice searchable interface. So I appreciate your taking us through that. Um, if no one is going to raise their hands, um, I do have a couple of questions that uh, people suggested. Um, ah, yes, Katie, please feel free to unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, this might be for everybody that spoke, but I was just curious. Um, to what extent are, uh, I think in the ORCID presentation, you talked about how once either a researcher, you know, adds something kind of to their ORCID ID or adds something to that data record that the university within, you know, 40 minutes can get information about that. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how that relationship with the university kind of systems works. And then I'm also interested if uh, how some of the federal government, like the SAM system, might in, might work with these PIDs as well. But I should say I'm from Spark. <laughs> well, thanks, Katie. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll I'll keep it brief and high level, and then if there's more specific questions, I'll I am happy to take those. 
So at a, at a very high level, or universities need to become members of ORCID and we do keep our membership fees as low as possible. That's really important to us. So we have greater um, adoption. So once you have ORCID membership, you'll get a member, a key to our member API and that will, that key can be assigned to one of your systems. And so we've got universities who are choosing a variety of systems. You know, some universities will prioritize their research administration department and so their systems, um, InfoEd comes to mind, Streamline, there's a few different vendors and some universities have custom systems as well. And so they'll connect that to ORCID. And so that way when say a funder uh, writes uh, the funding citation data to their ORCID record, we'll have that connection with the API to the university and we'll let them know that, oh, there's new data, would you like it? And then the data is transferred to the university to update their system, whatever they have there. And then it's the same the other way, it's mutual. So the university writes data, usually employment, to the ORCID record, the system is connected to the funder. There's the funding management system is updated with, you know, somebody you funded has a new role. Would you like that information? And they say yes. So that's kind of how we, at a very high level, um, transfer the data back and forth. Is that what you were looking for? Great, thanks. Carly, you probably want to Yes. Carly? Yeah. 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 So, so in terms of kind of other federal agencies, I, I think um, there's a, a spectrum of adoption um, in terms of different types of persistent identifiers. Um, um, specifically around ORCID, um, DOE does lead the U.S. government ORCID consortium, which is a mechanism for federal funding agencies to become ORCID members. And we have a community of practice. There's a lot of um, great information sharing. Um, there are uh, 23 members so far. Some of those are, are DOE specific members, but I think there are about 11 or 12 other funding agencies that are members. So um, as Shauna was describing, basically by becoming a member and working member through those consortiums, um, these other agencies have the ability to integrate their systems and kind of pass, you know, either read information from ORCID records or push information to ORCID records. And then in terms of the other persistent identifiers, it, it's kind of very in terms of the adoption. Um, in terms of SAM.gov, um, I, I have not uh, heard from any of those folks. I'm not sure um, if they've been involved directly with the kind of interagency big conversations, but, but would love um, if they're interested or if there's anyone who wants to make that connection, would love to come and talk to those folks. Brittany? Uh, yes, hi, I'm um, Brittany Sandler. I'm at Washington University uh, School of Medicine in St. Louis and um, specific probably for ORCID, but then all of the other organizations and that have, I know nothing has been mandated and the likelihood of it, of ORCID being the mandated PID isn't good necessarily, um, free will and all, and I get that, but is there a point where that will be, be strongly encouraged to adopt from a researcher standpoint is any if that is ever going to be put in a policy um probably a better question for my colleagues in the u.s government but i'll just quickly say um we've noticed some universities have decided to take that decision on and they have decided that you know orchid is the pit of choice for their researchers um stanford comes to mind uh there are others um, but I know what you mean. Uh, it's a, it is a little bit confusing. Um, NSF has specified in their policy, they are now saying ORCID. Um, and so I'm not sure where the other agencies will land when it comes to being specific. And like you said, there's freedom. Um, but we are seeing a few different approaches and it's all very positive for ORCID. And we really appreciate it. That's great. That's what we're pushing, but I'm just as curious. So thank you. Thanks. Anna, Anna Wetterberg. Yes, hi, thanks. I put this in the chat, but um, several people chimed in, so I'm going to read it out to you. Zhao Li, I was wondering, I thought I heard you mention that Datasite is working on identifying projects, um, yeah. sort of in passing, and if that's, if I heard that right, could you please elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm I'm typing a very long answer in the chat, because I guess I just, I just talk. Um, so yes, um, in the Ferroxo project, one of the deliverable uh, is a project level dashboard is very similar to, uh, it's based on data commons. It will be um, like a, a project level page that shows uh, like project metadata and all related work 
people and organization to a project. So um, it's very ambitious for you. Went through a couple of iterations to make sure it works the way I want it to work. But uh, um, uh, this is, um, and also in parallel, we also have been very closely collabing uh, with uh, with Ray. The ARDC is a, a project partner in Fairwave Flows to provide them with use cases like uh, um, from the project and to shape that RAID metadata. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar, RAID is uh, the research activity identifier um, led by ARDC. And uh, um, so that is to ensure the interoperability between data DOI and RAID. Um, and uh, uh, I think we, we have did a pretty good job. So currently we um, we are the, in the project, the proof of concept ID we use is a data DOI uh, to represent, to use the data DOI metadata property to describe a, a project activity. And data DOI has been used for uh, by like OSF, the Nodo, um, several integrators to identify project uh, uh, already so so it's like not very new practice um but we do uh are still the ongoing work to look at uh how how these our use can be related to other entities and what concerns our, our integrators and users have so like yeah so that's a long answer um but uh, i guess um join that conversation to directly reach out to me uh, we we're having that conversation um yeah Thank you so much. That was really super informative. I will reach out to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, I see we do also have a question um, from Shan Young Kim in the chat. We have uh, at least another minute. Uh, that's something about um, requiring re three um, requiring information in re three data. I don't know, Shelley, if you know. Um, if that's possible, I don't know if we have anyone who's directly involved with re three data on the call. Uh, that might be something that's better directed to them, um, but I'm not sure, to be honest. I just realized I'm on mute. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was, uh, go I was saying uh, registry data, um, to, to add record to registry data is relative um, straightforward process. Um, just reach out to them if I understand that question correctly. I can add a little more to that. Uh, sorry, Mike. Sure. Um, so, you know, it, I think it, what happened was in the old record, so I'm going to give an example of uh, imaging data comments, um, NCI data repository. And I was looking for specifically because um, I'm helping a lot of PIs writing data manager sharing plan for NIH applications. And the first ask is how your data will be findable. So you have to provide what type of PID the repository provides, and that's, you know, as upfront even in pilot templates these days. So that's why we looked up, but I couldn't believe how hard it was to find that information on their website. And even with the data.org, which is a repository, uh, because for the data repository, it doesn't have that information all the time. Some do, some don't. I think it, it, we need to standardize the template, for example, and all the data repository, they probably entered a long time ago, they never looked at it, they haven't updated it. The new ones tend to have uh, PID information, but um, we couldn't find it. So it, we ended up switching to different repository that has a PID information. So I think we need to standardize the information for data because NIH sharing data website has a great um you know table for NIH supported domain with uh repository domain specific repository, but PID information is missing. Same goes for VMIC data repository table, PID is missing. So this is a first information you're looking for when we look for data repository, and yet it's so hard to find. So mm -hmm. I think there's got to be some effort to standardize the metadata information for this data uh, repository, particularly PIDs. So whether they use the DOI or session number, that should be upfront so they be easily findable um, mm -hmm. for when they try to write a 
DMS client. So that's my main uh, thing since I'm Yes. Um, well, thanks for that. Um, I mean, I think we we might be able to put you in touch with people from Re3 Data if that if that might help. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's certainly something we can we can look into. Actually, I attended another webinar yesterday. Lisa Feder was talking about BMIC um, data repository. Mm -hmm. They recently updated the website, but unfortunately, the PI did not make it into the field, so that's that's too uh, bad. Easy to update. It is sad, but you know, hopefully, yeah. When yeah. they have another update, they will include it. Same goes for NIH sharing website. Hopefully, they include the information right. upfront. So we don't have to search so hard to find it. And I added another uh, question into the chat about orchid ID. Um, orchid ID is great, but it's really depends on what you put in. So if uh, when you send a manuscript, you know, if you enter your orchid ID, it gets pulled in automatically. All the other content is up to the owner of the ORCID ID, and some ORCID ID is bare. There's nothing in it. So you have an ID with no content whatsoever. So I think it, that we got to kind of make an effort to standardize some basic information to make ORCID ID more useful. So start using ROAR for the validation and some other information. So we can't totally rely on automatic update. So we have a research profile that Pulls all the information if you can maybe connect it or can I be a lot more useful? But instead of leaving everything up to the owner, we gotta have some mandated standardization of the important information so it can you know cross react with all the other kids, for example. So that's my yeah. <laughs> we understand and uh, thank you. Yeah. Oh great. Um, so just quickly, the researcher who owns the record is in full control of their record at all times. And so they can decide which data they want to make public or trusted or private. And so we have, we certainly have examples of the data that it's a fulsome record, but they've made all the data only trusted uh, visibility. Uh, so, you know, we really want to make sure that this is useful to researchers as a tool that represents them in their professional careers. Um, that being said, we do agree with you that we want to make it easier for researchers to get data into their ORCID profiles and really from those trusted organizations, from the publishers, from the funders, from the universities. And so we're working really hard with all the different vendors that provide systems to those different stakeholders. And so we're trying to get it built into the system. And so that way it's easy for this administrative staff and those stakeholder organizations to write data to ORCID records and then also mutually benefit from reading the data from their ORCID records. So they have that updated data about their researchers and they don't have to bother the researcher to tell them about their recent publications or funding. They can get that data automatically through the system. So we're working really hard on it and it is a strategic priority for us in 24. So we'll keep trying, um, but if yeah. there's anything, please let us know. Right. And with that being said, I am going to cut us off. We are five minutes over time. Um, I think uh, we will share the slides and the recording afterward, and uh, we have contact information there. Um, I will stay on for a little bit um, to answer any other questions. And I am going to uh, launch a feedback poll um, for the session. If you do have a brief moment to fill that out, I would much appreciate it. But if not, I'll uh, send uh, some kind of feedback request by email for all of the registrants. Thank you all to our presenters. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone who registered and attended. Very much appreciate it. Okay.